In my review of Shadows Waiting, episode two of The Wheel of Time, I mentioned that I thought it was a vast improvement over the previous episode, and it got the series moving in the right direction. Today, we're going to examine each scene in episode two. I'll show you what specific things I liked, what I didn't like, and I'll point out all the book spoilers and Easter eggs from episode two of The Wheel of Time, titled Shadows Waiting. Now, before jumping right in, make sure to subscribe to the channel. There is a ton of content coming out right now, and the best way to not miss any of it is to subscribe. About 40% of you that are watching are not subscribed. Make sure that's not you. Don't be a dark friend. Let's hit the spoiler warning for the video. Today's video will carry a spoiler rating of red with major spoilers through episode two of the TV show and The Dragon Reborn, the third book of the series. If you have not watched episode two and read up through book three, watch this at your own risk, you've been warned. So episode two kicks off with this amazing cold open that begins with this continuous drone shot through this white cloak camp. Pay attention here, as this is where we're about to be with my man Eamon Volda and his dinner guest. They look like they're about to roast marshmallows. Now check out this thing that the boy gives to Valda. Now that is quite nasty and quite awesome. I absolutely love the way Abdul Salis is playing Eamon Valda. He's the perfect level of menacing and creepy. Now you'll notice that he has an Aes Sedai tied up to the stake that he's about to burn her with. As we see this close up of her, you'll see this wound or her head and the bleeding all around it. Now this implies that she was hit in the head, which would make sense if that was the way they were able to capture an Aes Sedai. As we circle back behind her, we see that her hands have been cut off. And I'm a huge fan of the level of gore here. He removes her Aes Sedai ring and puts it in his belt as a trophy before burning her alive where we can see her reflection in his cup. Have I said I'm a huge fan of this scene yet? Now we then cut to the first time that we see this opening sequence. Now I'm not gonna cover it all here, but I'm a huge fan of adding something thematic to the opening of the show with various threads and patterns weaving together. My hope is that they will incorporate the happenings in the show into the pattern in subsequent seasons. So maybe this picture will change over time, let's hope. We then pick right up where the last episode ended with this chase scene with the Trollocs after the group on horseback. This culminates with the group finally arriving here at Hightower's little hut. He apparently sleeps outside waiting for people to cross in the middle of the night, and his son is on the way in the middle of the night for some reason. I generally like this clip quite a bit. The shots of the Fade moving through the Trollocs are awesome, and the Trollocs look really, really menacing. I do think it's a little dumb that Hightower would just jump into the water like he's going to be a lifeguard for his ferry when it's 30 feet out into the water and an Aes Sedai is in the middle of sinking it. I don't blame Maureen here, he's an absolute idiot. We then cut to these incredible landscape shots of the group traveling that certainly evokes Lord of the Rings with the scale and just the way these things are shot. We get this scene of Moraine taking the tiredness away from the horses, which is a bit odd to me. It would have made sense for them to do this while they were being chased, but now that they are relatively safe in the moment and she's injured, it doesn't make as much sense. And Leanne says that to her. Uh, the horses are good, Moraine. Chill. We also get this shot of the kids chatting around the fire. I love it. We get Matt being a smartass, Egwene being pragmatic, Rand is being broody and defiant, and Perrin is still emo over fridging his wife. Now, these are moments I really love because we're getting a better feel for who these characters are, both in personality, but also in what motivates them. Here we move to a scene where Moraine begins to talk to Egwene about channeling and giving her kind of a quick midnight lesson. Apparently the best time to learn to channel is in the middle of the night when Trollocs are after you. All joking aside, this is an absolutely brilliant conversation to introduce the three oaths. It doesn't come across as exposition to me. I think it's very well written with the way that she questions it and then answers her own questions. It doesn't feel overly talky. Now the transition to the explanation of the one power is also outstanding. This dialogue was well written and well acted. It's an absolutely brilliant scene. Egwene leaves her little lesson in the middle of the night and goes to see Rand, who has apparently moved his sleeping bag out of the cave. They share a look before Rand basically tells Egwene to piss off. He's being very moody, but in his defense, he's still kind of shaken up by everything that's happened and the fact that he thinks Egwene broke up with him earlier. Now, I do love how this leads into the first dream sequence of the TV series. We get Rand coughing up this bat, which is amazingly nasty and creepy. Then we get the money shot here. We get Baal Zaman appearing with his fire eyes and all, and it's very horror movie-esque. And I was genuinely surprised for some reason that we got a dream sequence and that the Forsaken are going to be in this first season of the show. Now, I wonder how they will eventually pay off a Shamael in the TV series, or if they will make him out to be the Dark One like they do in the books. We'll have to wait and see. Now, once they're 
they're all woken up, Rand has a bit of a freak out moment when he realizes that they have all coughed up bats and starts to go at Moraine, accusing her of doing it. Now I love how Lan comes flying over to get between them and basically challenges Rand to fuck around and find out. And Rand wisely does not keep coming at Moraine, physically at least. Moraine tells them to let her know if they have these dreams again, and then tells them that dreams have power. Rand asks her what that means, and she essentially ignores him and tells him it's time to go. Now, I can't stress how good the writing of this section is. This is exactly how Moraine would have been in the books. This is always what she did to them. And sometimes it caused bigger problems because she underestimated how stubborn they could be. She never answered their questions or got their buy-in. And this is honestly part of the reason I think episode two felt so much better for everyone. The characters felt a lot more real to us. Now, Rand and Egwene have an argument, and for a brief moment, it looks like Rand might stay put in the middle of the woods. But I love how Moraine did not push Rand to come because she knew that she had Egwene and that Egwene would follow her and that Rand would follow Egwene. But I also love that she left Lan behind to make sure that Rand came. So this is so very Moraine. Again, great writing. Here we get an encounter with the White Cloaks. Now, it's also a perfect explanation of the three oaths that we just learned about in the previous scene. We hear Moraine say that she's a lady from a fallen house, which she is. Moraine is a Damodred from the house that was once the ruling family in Kyrian. In fact, her uncle was King Laman Damodred, the king that sparked the Aiel War. Her house was overthrown, but the viewers don't know this, and I love that little bit of backstory here. During the encounter with the White Cloaks, Bornhold comes across very grandfatherly, just as he does in the books. He has his beliefs, but he isn't evil. Now, Valda, on the other hand, comes across quite evil. I love the way that the Aes Sedai can say things that mislead you without lying here. It's a great way of showing and not telling, and then this is driven home later when Moraine is confronted about it by Egwene. One thing I did not love in this scene was Bornhold saying Aes Sedai are the only way to save her. It's not that I don't think he could do that, but it's more that I don't think that a White Cloak Lord Captain could say that in front of a questioner, knowing that it's against what they believe and not be put to the question himself. We then move to these epic landscape shots, a travel montage basically. This does accurately reflect the books in the lack of settlements, but I always found that odd in this area of Andor that it would be so barren and underpopulated, especially if the population of this nation is around 10 million people, as Robert Jordan always said. Anyways, these shots are very epic and very beautiful. Definitely cool shots. We then move to the shot of the group walking to pass the time. Matt starts singing a song all of the kids probably know called Weep for Manetherin. Now, I love that Perrin automatically knows to echo the others. They're doing kind of like a choreographed singing. This perfectly leads into Moraine giving the backstory of Manetherin. Now, I love that this concept was introduced here and the backstory. It's amazing for world building. And honestly, it's just such a great moment from the books. Rosamund Pike delivers the speech to perfection. And you just can't help but feel some emotion as she describes the fall of Manetherin. Major eggplants for including this in the story, and I really would have liked to have seen her say this to the people of the Two Rivers in episode one, but this was an okay replacement. Here we get the scene of Perrin meeting this pack of wolves. Now at first, he thinks he's toast. He thinks they're about to eat him and tear him up. But one comes over and just licks his wound on the leg and leaves. And they are introducing the wolves to us very slowly, not explaining a whole lot. Now, I can't wait to see where this goes. And I'm not going to lie and say the introduction of the wolves here is just missing a certain someone that I think would normally be here. But we'll talk about that in the next video. But I do think that that particular individual's absence is felt. Now, here we get them all camping with Maureen sleeping. I love how Lan just says to the kids, go to bed. And they do. Uh, in reality, I don't totally love that. Uh, I think it was a bit awkward to me that they just immediately did it given how defiant they all are. It's not that it's bad necessarily, it was just too quick of a reaction in my opinion. And yes, that's a nitpick, but hey, it is what it is. Nevertheless, we get this fade overlooking the camp and they quickly pack up and leave and head to Shadar Logoth at Land's behest. Now we get our first shots of the city and geez, look at those walls. Legit, those are probably 100 foot plus walls, which is absolutely nuts. As they enter the city, you can feel how absolutely desolate and barren it is. I love the creepy vibe to it and how silent the city is. Now the sets look incredible and the buildings look massive and the city is absolutely gigantic. The architecture is really unique. I'm a big fan of the way the set feels and looks. I just wish they spent more time here. Now one nitpick here is the large amounts of wood that appear everywhere. Ardhal, the city that would become Shadar Logoth, fell almost 2,000 years prior to this point in the story. There would be no exposed wood that's going to be intact anywhere in that time period. Again, it's just a nitpick. We do get a brief history of the city from Lan and his warning to the boys not to touch anything. Now, if you do want the full history and full story of Ard Hall, 
and how it turns into Shadar Logoth, check out my video on Arid Hall for a full history and map of the city. But right after Lan tells the story, we get some great comic relief and lines from Matt about how many words Lan has said and asking why he brought them here. Now it's great and Lan doesn't really answer him, which leads to Matt not really understanding that he shouldn't go take that dagger later. Again, all of these things are very true to the characters, and I think that's why this episode started to feel a lot more like the Wheel of Time. Now we then move to this really awesome scene between Matt and Perrin, where Matt gives Perrin a knife made by Layla and tells a story about how she made tools and not weapons. It's heartwarming, and it's a great character moment for Perrin's arc. Yes, these scenes are not direct to the book, but Perrin and Matt are so much better fleshed out here than in the books at this point. You can actually connect to them here, whereas in the books, they're basically just sidekicks in the story. We also get a line in this dialogue of Perrin saying to Matt that the girls would be taken care of. And I'm really glad this was put in here because this was a massive misstep in the first episode, in my opinion, as it didn't feel realistic for Matt to leave without knowing that his sisters were taken care of. Now here we kept outside the building and just listen to this. You hear that? One more time. What is it? It's the same whistling that we heard when Pot on Fane arrived in the Two Rivers. It also happens to correspond to when we see Mashadar start to move out from the buildings. Now as Matt awakens, we see him follow a shadow figure into a room where he finds the dagger. Now I'm not sure if that's meant to be Mordeth or Pot on Fane, but I'm glad they didn't do Mordeth the way he was portrayed in the books. I know that's going to be a controversial opinion, but I think it would have been very confusing and very odd. And I'm glad they're doing this kind of different, and I like that Matt finds the dagger on his own. I am not entirely sure how the whistling connects yet. Pot on Fane isn't Mashadar in the TV series, at least not yet. And so why would the whistling for him in the opening and then there be whistling for Mashadar? I have a feeling we'll find out something about that later on, but I don't know what it is yet. The dagger itself looks great. I know that some are upset that the jewel is not on the hilt, but that was explained by Rafe as they tried it multiple times, came up with a number of copies, and it just never came through for viewers like they wanted. So they made the alteration for the camera. I am fine with the dagger the way as it came out. Uh, it's not really a huge deal to me. It looks awesome. It gets the point across. But right after this, we see Mashadar start to overtake the horses, essentially disintegrating one of the horses right in front of the group. They get split up, and there's some great drama as they all try to escape the city and go different directions. Now, in terms of the way they did Mashadar, I get why they did what they did rather than fog some of that rationale i think comes around in episode four as we will see the taint on sidine but i can't say that i wouldn't have rather seen the fog i just think the fog is more ethereal and creepy and really unnatural i'm not saying that the black stuff was bad just maybe that i would have preferred the fog in terms of the escape it was super kind and generous of mashadar to wait to catch the kids and give them all time to escape and so just at the very last second they could get away it was really great for them to wait but Mashadar knows that it can't kill all the main characters this early. And then at the end of the episode, we get the shot of Nynaeve surprising everyone that she is not only alive, but she has tracked Lan all the way to Shadar Logoth and has him at knife point. I absolutely loved this ending, and it was really a far, far better episode than the first. My main gripe is that we didn't get more time in Shadar Logoth, but I love that we ended up wanting more and the pacing allowed for some great character moments that I think will pay off down the road. So that is my episode two breakdown. What did you think of the episode? Make sure to let me know what you thought in the comments of the video. Also, make sure to like the video and subscribe to the channel to be updated when I release new Wheel of Time videos. Also, make sure to follow me on Twitter, at BlissNay, for other updates and when I do rewatch parties with the show account. If you want to support the content that I'm making here on the channel, please consider checking out my Patreon and helping fund all this work. Thank you to all of you that already support me. I could not do this without you. Thank you, everybody, and until next time, peace out.